actually, the entire fossil record is a testament to the predictions of evolutionary biology. As is already plainly clear, we are going to have to wade through a lot of nonsense in this segment. Darwin said that he believed the fossil record would show transitional species, like the long sought after missing link, a creature that would be something more than an ape, but less than a human. Darwin predicted that transitional fossils would be found, and many have. Darwin knew his thoughts about evolution would stand or fall on whether or not these in-between links existed. There is much more to evolutionary biology than fossils. Nucleotide sequence homology, morphological homology, adaptation, speciation, and extinction are but a few of the other observations which support evolutionary biology. In fact, it was Darwin himself who warned, unless transitional forms could be found in the fossil record, the theory of evolution is worthless speculation. Nothing really beats a quote mine based on a misquote. Darwin predicted that the fossil record would show a progression from simple to complex, and it does. In other words, if evolution was ever going to be proven to be true, it would first have to find fossils that showed these in-between links between various species actually existed. Again, the fossil record is but one avenue of research into evolutionary biology. He speculated that when these intermediate fossils were found, they would clearly show the steps from one species to the next. No, Darwin hypothesized that transitional fossils would share characteristics of two related groups. Many such transitional fossils have been found. Arguably, all fossils, and all living organisms for that matter, are transitional. That means there would be fossil records of very strange-looking creatures. Evolution does not require such. However, the fossil record does contain several otherworldly fossils, such as Anomalocaris, a predatory protoarthropod of the Cambrian era, which could reach lengths up to two meters. Fish with beginnings of legs. Meet Tiktaalik. Reptiles with primitive wings. Meet Archaeopteryx and ape-like creatures with human characteristics and meet Australopithecus afarensis because my favorite is a platypus and the reason it, the, the platypus is my favorite is because it was discovered in 1797 and, and sent back to the British Museum and the British scientists actually thought that some taxidermist had cut up all these different animals and stuck them all back together again. Dr. George Shaw initially questioned the veracity of the specimen prior to his examination of it. Dr. Shaw was skeptical, as all scientists must be. Dr. Shaw later published the first scientific description of the platypus in 1799. Because they, they got this funny looking creature that had a bill like a duck. No, the bill of a platypus is at best superficially similar to that of a bird, if you have no understanding of anatomy. Can a beaver like Tyler? No, nope. unlike a beaver, the tail of a platypus is not scaly. Like the Tasmanian Devil, a platypus uses its tail to store fat. Hair like a bear and wet feet like an otter. No, the layered hair of a platypus is adapted to serve as insulation for its aquatic environment. The webbing of its feet is more similar to that found in birds. Claws like a reptile, laid eggs like a turtle, feeds a chunk of milk like a mammal, has spurs like a rooster and poison like a snake. Not even close. First, the spurs of the platypus are in no way homologous to those of a rooster. Second, the venom of a platypus is composed of over 250 compounds. However, the four major active components are defensins. Defensins are small peptides which are part of the immune system. Three of the four are completely unique to the platypus. Additionally, unlike the venom of a snake, that of a platypus has no necrotizing ability. Now, if you found an animal like that, you'd think somebody would stitched all these animals together. But in actual fact, uh, this is a beautifully designed little creature. Nope, monotremes are not very well adapted. In fact, there's only three extant species remaining. Like most of the natural fauna of Australia, they can be easily displaced by invasive mammals. And you see, the interesting thing is this. If you're going to believe in evolution and believe one kind of animal changed into another, and here you have one that has features of reptiles, birds, and mammals, you have to believe it almost evolved from everything. That straw man was just sad. Is Mr. Ham even trying anymore? But the reason it's my favorite creature is because I think every time an evolutionist looks at the platypus, I think God smiles because I think he made it just for them. So, what does evolutionary biology say about the platypus? Monotremes were an early divergence from mammals. 
The platypus possesses characteristics of early therian mammals, such as gait, limbs attached at sides, and leathery eggs. It also possesses classical mammalian characteristics, such as hair, mammary glands, and endothermy. The most shocking transitional characteristic is found in the sex chromosomes. The platypus possesses 10 sex chromosomes, with the XY, 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 XY arrangement resulting in a male. The platypus does not use the SRY development toll pathway found in other mammals. While the exact process of sex determination remains unknown, a region of one Y chromosome contains portions of the ZZZW sex developmental pathway found in modern birds. Evolutionary biology is capable of explaining all of these observations. Mr. Ham dismisses these amazing findings as his deity's notion of a joke. In order to preserve the sanity of you, the viewer, we are going to quickly summarize Miss Folger's outright lies. She claims that there are no transitional fossils, and repeats that claim seven times over the course of two minutes. Richard Milton, Dwayne Gish, and Ken Ham then chime in to repeat the claim once, twice, and once again, respectively. Then, Mr. Ham launches into a non-sequitur about coelacanths. A few scientists are quote-mined. Mr. Ham invokes the magic of kinds three times. However, he fails to click his heels while doing so, so it still doesn't work. And another scientist is quote-mined. The evolutionists realize that they can no longer rely on the fossil record to give them any support. So, does the fossil record support common descent? Let us see if we can trace the evolution of a rather well-known organism through the fossil record. Let us begin our all-too-brief glimpse at but a few of the known transitional fossils. We're going to be starting with the invertebrate to vertebrate transition. Pacaya is one of the earliest known fossils with a proto-notochord. Uninozoan is a hemichordate, showing quite a bit of increased complexity and development over Pacaya. Hycoella is an early chordate. While lacking bones and movable jaws, it does possess other characteristics of modern vertebrates, such as gills, a brain, notochord, heart, and a circulatory system. Conodonts were eel-like organisms with eyes and fins with fin rays. They're known largely by their teeth. In the picture below, you can see a sampling of the different teeth on the head of a pin. Here, we see two examples of primitive fish. Placoderms were not only one of the earliest jawed fishes, but they were also one of the earliest vertebrate predators. Acanthodians shared characteristics of both bony fish as well as cartilaginous fish. Rolepus is a bony fish, which was the common ancestor to both modern ray-finned fish as well as lobe-finned fish. Osteolepus is an early lobed-finned fish already showing of amphibium-like skull and teeth. Eusthenoopteron possessed an amphibium-like skull, but more importantly, the bones and muscle attachments of its fins were becoming extremely similar to those found in tetrapod limbs. Pandorichthys was very tetrapod-like, possessing a flattened body, as well as foot-like fins. When we come to Acanthostega, we see that the fin-to-foot transition is almost complete. In Tiktaalik, we see that the fins now possess wrist and finger bones, which are adaptations for bearing weight. Additionally, Tiktaalik possesses a neck, as well as lungs and gills. In Ichthyostega, we see that the shoulder and pelvis have also become very tetrapod-like. Additionally, it possesses a robust rib cage extremely similar to that found in tetrapods. Pteroplax is representative of early land amphibians. The skull bone patterns remain similar to Ichthyostega, and the remnants of gills can be found at the neck. Proterogyrenus possessed an amphibian-like skull, but the limbs and spine were beginning to take on reptilian characteristics. In Solenodonsaurus, we see the loss of the lateral line on the head. Lanamus and Paleothyrus are both small, lizard-like organisms, which retained an amphibian-like skull. Pelicosaurs were primitive synapsids with differentiated teeth and a hard palate. Therapsids were mammal-like reptiles possessing complex jaws and teeth. Their legs were vertically attached under their bodies, as opposed to laterally at their sides. In the proto-mammals, we see further development of mammalian skull characteristics. 
At last we arrive at early placentals. They were small and rodent-like organisms. So what about marsupials and monotremes? They diverged previously to the advent of placentals. In the case of marsupials, there exists a fairly strong fossil record. In the case of monotremes, we know them mostly from their jaws. Returning to placentals, early primates are known largely by their skull fragments and jaws. In this case, they still did not look much like modern primates, except that their teeth began to take on primate-like characters. We know the ancestors to Old World primates largely by their jaws and skull fragments, both of which lead to the conclusion that brain size was increasing, while the length of its nose was decreasing. Propylopithecus is an early ape known by its jaw. Its teeth became a defining characteristic for apes. Egyptopithecus is an anthropoid ape possessing a much larger and rounder brain. Proconsul possesses features of both apes and monkeys. This is also where we begin to observe sexual dimorphism. Kenyapithecus, a descendant of Proconsul, is an ancestor to great apes and humans. Australopithecus afarensis was a slender and ape-like organism. It was also bipedal. Australopithecus africanus was even more slender than afarensis and possessed a larger brain. Its teeth possessed similar characteristics as those found in species of the genus Homo. At long last, we arrive at humans. Homo habilis straddles the Australopithecine Homo boundary. It possessed a larger brain and is associated with the first primitive stone tools. However, it may represent two distinct species of Homo. Homo erectus had a much larger brain and a thick brow ridge. It is associated with much better stone tools, as well as the first use of fire. Archaic Homo sapiens possessed a brain size intermediate to H. erectus in modern humans. They also possessed a much less robust skeleton and teeth than their predecessors. Homo sapiens sapiens are modern humans. While our brain size has increased in comparison to archaic Homo sapiens, our skeletal and muscular system is less robust. Now, we know you're all asking, what about Neanderthals? Well, Homo neanderthalensis was a side lineage. They were very successful for a time, but they've gone extinct. Based on the current evidence, they did not contribute to the genome of modern humans. So what they've done is they've come up with a very crafty alternative to the Darwinian concept of evolution. They call it punctuated equilibrium. Punctuated equilibrium is a hypothesis which was put forward by the late Dr. Stephen Jay Gould and Dr. Niles Eldridge. In simplicity, punctuated equilibrium hypothesizes that evolution can occur in rapid bursts with slow anagenic change occurring during the interim. The theory says evolution is stable for long periods of time. Then new species suddenly come into being and others immediately become extinct. Dr. Gould was a master of communicating his ideas to the public. As such, we feel that the response to this atrocious mischaracterization can best be answered by Dr. Gould's own explanation of his hypothesis. A new species can arise when a small segment of the ancestral population is isolated at the periphery of the ancestral range. Large, stable, central populations exert a strong homogenizing influence. New and favorable mutations are diluted by the sheer bulk of the population through which they must spread. They may build slowly in frequency, but the changing environments usually cancel their selective value long before they reach fixation. Thus, phyletic transformation in large populations should be very rare, as the fossil record proclaims. But small, peripherally isolated groups are cut off from their parental stock. They live as tiny populations in geographic corners of the ancestral range. Selective pressures are usually intense because the peripheries mark the edge of the ecological tolerance for the ancestral forms. Favorable variations spread quickly. Small peripheral isolates are a laboratory of evolutionary change. What should the fossil record include if most evolution occurs by speciation in peripheral isolates? Species should be static through their range because our fossils are the remains of large central populations. In any local area inhabited by ancestors, a descendant species should appear suddenly by migration from the peripheral region in which it evolved. 
and the peripheral region itself, we might find direct evidence of speciation, but such good fortune would be rare indeed, because the event occurs so rapidly in such a small population. Thus, the fossil record is a faithful rendering of what evolutionary theory predicts, not a pitiful vestige of a once bountiful tale. You see, this solves all kinds of problems intellectually for the evolutionists. Not at all. The idea was not even very novel. Charles Darwin, as well as Alfred Russell Wallace, among others, proposed similar ideas. The difference is that Dr. Gould stressed peripheral population. He doesn't have to look at the fossil record. Comically enough, Dr. Gould was, and Dr. Eldridge is, a paleontologist by training. And both have studied the fossil record extensively. I'm convinced that the idea of punctuated equilibria is really a desperate attempt to salvage evolutionary theory. We are convinced. That was an appeal to ridicule. Punctuated equilibrium is an explanation of some of the observations in the fossil record. There is no evidence in the fossil record that one type of animal ever changed into another type of animal. Do you still remember those transitional fossils that we covered previously? Punctuated equilibria comes along and says that isolated populations of animals evolved rapidly and left no fossil trace. No. It stated that isolated populations evolve rapidly, and finding fossils from the small peripheral population would be a challenge. But this is an argument from lack of data. There are no transitional forms, and that's used then as proof of the brand of evolution called punctuated equilibria. According to creationists, this does not exist. This is bad science. We agree. The caliber of research being conducted by the ICR is atrocious. We are skipping the hatchet job on Dr. Richard Goldschmidt. Dr. Goldschmidt's saltationism hypothesis was rejected long ago, and insulting him at this stage is just too childish. It seems like almost every new development in science is converging to destroy evolution. And that's true. It is a blatant lie. Regardless of whether we're talking about new discoveries in astronomy... Astronomy is not evolutionary biology or paleontology or biology, this is true. No, evolutionary biology is the foundation of modern biology. In the last decade, most of the basic pillars upon which evolution has stood have collapsed, and the theory is now in chaos. It's anarchy, I tell you. Anarchy. Researchers are burning down labs, textbooks are being burned in mass, graduate students are spontaneously combusting. Anarchy. No, wait. Miss Folger is lying. Again. Unfortunately, at this time, the evolutionists are crying louder than ever before that evolution is a fact. Actually, most biologists completely ignore creationists. Parents, however, cry rather loudly when creationists try to supplant science with their religion in the public classroom. And well, way to go, parents. You should. If evolution was true, wouldn't be concerned about the extinction of species. There'd be new ones being created. Speciation events are happening. Extinction is a concern because once a population is gone, it's gone forever. Also, someone should email Chuck Misler and inform him that an extinct population cannot undergo further divergence. We don't have two species. Why is Mr. Misler denying a well-known fact? We got deterioration. Who came up with that conclusion? Simply because life is not adapting as you see fit does not equate with deterioration. We have all kinds of species that no longer exist. This is known as extinction. It is a prediction of evolutionary biology. That just does not even make sense. If something has been found, it can no longer be described as missing. Words have meaning for a purpose. Let's consider the case of human beings. Now you know why we already covered those fossils. Evolutionists say humans came from apes. Actually, humans are apes. We have much finer body hair, walk upright, and have a slight intelligence advantage. But to be brutally honest, we're little more than inbred mutant apes that are balding. For years, some scientists tried to pass off certain fossil discoveries as the missing link between the two species. The problem is, every last case was shown to be either a fraud or an error. Why Ms. Folger chose to use such juvenile antics is a mystery. We employ such tactics in our long videos because we know many of you have ADD and we need to snap your attention back to us. However, as previously shown, 
there are a great many number of hominid fossils. Darwin's answer is that we and modern apes have evolved from some common ape-like ancestor uh, millions of years in the past. Dr. Donald Johansson, director of the Institute of Human Origins at Arizona State University, discovered Lucy, an alleged ape-to-man missing link. There is nothing alleged about the Australopithecus afarensis specimen known as Lucy. Here's what Dr. Johansson said in a NOVA program on PBS. I was headed back to my Land Rover. It was about noontime, and I was going to uh, drive back to camp. And uh, I just happened to look over my right shoulder, and I noticed a, a small piece of bone resting on the surface of the ground. And as I began to look around and scan the slope, I could see not only bits of a leg, but bits of a skull, a little piece of a jaw. And I realized right there in that noonday sun that what I had literally stumbled across was most of an entire skeleton. Here was a skeleton of a creature that looked like it could walk like us, but with many ape-like features. The ape that stood up, it was a revolutionary idea. It was a revolutionary idea, all right. Unfortunately, it didn't turn out to be a missing link. Because it had been found. Remember, words have meaning. Though Johansson still claims it is. Is Miss Folger really trying to portray Dr. Johansson as a French kook? Lucy is placed as an early hominid because the evidence dictates such. Lucy has been restored in museums around the world to look like a human ancestor. She's usually given uh, a sort of an ape-like face and a human-like body, human hands, human feet. The truth is that um, Lucy's bones are actually those of an extinct arboreal ape. Many uh, anthropologists who've examined Australopithecus remains have come to the conclusion that it's nothing more than an extinct ape. The restored Lucy. The knee joint would hint that Lucy was human. Lucy has no knee joint. The pelvis, femur, and tibia of Lucy are more similar to those of humans than to those of chimpanzees. But what the evolutionists don't tell you is that the knee joint was found about a mile away and almost 200 feet deeper than the other bones. More crack research. This nonsense originates from a creationist named Tom Willis in 1987. Johansson discovered a second Australopithecus at a nearby site. That find consisted of a pair of legs with a complete knee joint. Lucy has no knee joint. That means the knee belonged to another creature, a human. The creationist logic train has officially derailed and is spilling thousands of gallons of noxious nonsense into the environment. Please take appropriate action to protect yourselves. The second find was actually a prior find, which occurred a year before the discovery of Lucy. While the rest of the bones were from an extinct ape. Yes. Australopithecus is extinct, and hominids are apes, including humans. For it to be a missing link, fossils would have to show that the intermediate creatures had the capacity to make tools and walk erect. That goalpost just keeps moving. It is not enough that an Australopithecus has been shown to be adapted to bipedal locomotion. Miss Folger wants a fossil found holding a shovel. Quality humans possess. As well as chimpanzees. Yet no such fossils have ever been found. Tool use has been observed and is well documented in chimpanzees. It is not a defining characteristic of humans. Additionally, fossils are the remains of organisms which have died. It is rather difficult to observe them doing much of anything, let alone using tools. Walking upright is something that only humans can do. Is it really? and it needs a special kind of knee joint. There are many other adaptations needed for bipedalism than those of the knee. Changes in the pelvis and femur are much more crucial and are observed in Australopithecus. One that can be locked straight. A chimp gets around on all fours. If it tries to walk upright, its knee joint doesn't lock. It's forced to walk with a bent leg, and that's tiring. So the evolutionist has to somehow find an animal that has at least the uh, latent capacity to make tools. Again, 
that poor goalpost is forced to move across town by the creationist mob. Tool making is not a defining characteristic of humans. New Caledonian crows have been observed to make hooks. Uh, the noble crow, scourge to farmers worldwide, and apparently creation scientists as well. This crow takes a straight piece of pliable wire, bends it to form a hook, and then uses its new tool to retrieve a small basket containing food. Tool use is not a defining characteristic of humans. Walking right. Has evolved multiple times. And uh, a relatively uh, large brain. These fossils do not exist. But at this point, you must be thinking, what about all those displays at the museums? Please, do not go the conspiracy route. The pictures of an ape gradually becoming upright, like a man. I've seen those with my own eyes. Even though museums around the world show displays of half-men, half-apes as the missing links, they aren't real. Miss Folger has returned to the evil evolutionist conspiracy nonsense. Like here at London's Natural History Museum, listen to Dr. Chris Stringer, a paleoanthropologist at the museum. We think that humans separated from apes about five million years ago, although there is not fossil evidence of that period of separation. Although there is not fossil evidence of that period of separation. Brief lesson in divergence estimates for those unwilling to actually read the procedure for themselves. Yes, we mean the ICR. Divergence estimates utilize nucleotide sequence evolution. Fossils act as the calibration points, providing a maximum and minimum date for the divergence. This information, as well as extremely detailed explanations of the procedures, is readily accessible in almost any bioinformatics textbook, let alone a basic search of the scientific literature. We are skipping the billionth rehashing of Nebraska Man and the Piltdown hoax. Suffice to say, scientists righted these errors. Creationists did nothing. Like the fossil remains dubbed Homo habilis, here's what Dr. Stringer, an evolutionist, has to say about it. Yes, Hablis is a problem taxon. I think there are at least two species represented. And creationists agree. Homo habilis was made up of at least two, if not more, different groups that do not belong together. It was a, a, an assemblage of, of several different types of animals put together and made into one. Specimen OH7 is the type specimen for Homo habilis. Type specimen means that it was the first found. The characteristics from it are the defining characteristics of the species. Based on examination, there appears to have been a second Homo species, i.e. different from OH7, which was included in some of the specimens dubbed H. habilis, as Dr. Stringer stated. Mr. Lubinow has apparently failed to read any of the published literature. Homo erectus, or Java Man, isn't a half-man, half-ape either. The man who discovered it admitted before he died that it was a fraud. That was a lie. He confessed that he had found an ape skull about 50 feet away from a human leg and two human skulls, and had mixed and matched to create a fictitious creature. The only fraud here is the rampant dishonesty employed by the ICR. Dr. Eugene Du Bois found several human skulls in cave deposits. He found the H. erectus fossil in river deposits in a floodplain 65 miles from the other finds. The femur is from a modern human. The teeth belong to an orangutan. The skull cap belongs to H. erectus based on comparison with other finds which came later. Both creationists and evolutionists now admit Neanderthal man is a human. Much like H. erectus, H. neanderthalensis is an extinct hominid. Homo is the genus containing all human species. 
Scientists from Johns Hopkins University x-rayed the bones and found it was a human male stooped over from rickets or arthritis. One specimen was found to have suffered rickets in childhood, broken bones in middle age, and arthritis in old age. There are hundreds of specimens of H. neanderthalensis. The study in question referred to only one. We cut the mindless denialism which followed. Essentially, the ICR repeats the claim that all of the fossils we have been discussing do not exist. Mr. Ham then concludes this segment by playing the evil evolutionist conspiracy card yet again.